So
It's dark. The world lies in sin and error pining. The shadows are conspiring, but a light is coming. The Lord has been quiet for four centuries. The prophets are gone. There are no signs to see. It's silent. But let me tell you something. A voice is coming. The patriarchs are long dead. The judges were traded for a bunch of crowned heads. This monarchy, though, consistently failed and misled. No system is working. But there's a new king coming. Man's dead in religion. Legalism reigns. Ceremonial acts, which are just simply profane. The law is not working, but a new covenant is coming. The people are defiling. The rituals God is despising. Even the priests are compromising. And the sin offerings, they're worthless sacrificing. Oh, but get ready because a lamb is coming. The temple is a den of thieves. A brood of vipers are the Pharisees. Same too for the Sadducees. They don't even know there's a new high priest coming. The nations are suffering. Evil is chuckling. And the faithful are left wondering, does God even care? Oh, let me tell you something. Emmanuel is coming. God's people desire a glorious king. The world is yearning for eternity. A perfect sacrifice each soul desperately needs. 
it's a silent night, but hope is in sight. A most precious gift God is bestowing. The Bethlehem star begins glowing. Let the good news start growing. A baby is coming. Greetings, everyone. I'm Jasmine Valencia, and I'd like to share some information about giving financially at our church. Before we talk about how to give, let's talk about where it goes. Whenever you give to the Potomac Valley Church, you'll have three options to specify where that money goes. General Operations, which supports our church's operating expenses. Benevolence, which we save separately in order to provide for members in crisis or community members who come to us in need. And lastly, missions, which is the most wide-reaching category that serves needs locally and abroad with our family of churches and the communities we serve. Now that we know where your financial gift will go, let's talk about how to give. For those of you prepared to give today, you can give online through your own bank using the bill pay function. You can give using easy and secure payments through our Church Center mobile app. Finally, you can mail your own check or money order to our church office and payments will be processed through our bank weekly. If you missed anything or need additional details and clarification, you can find all of this and more on our website at www.potomacvalleychurch.com forward slash give. Thank you for your participation and heart to serve with a financial gift today. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Potomac Valley. We're so grateful that you join us for worship, and I want to be among the first to wish you a Merry Christmas. And I pray that you're having an incredible Sunday morning as we're worshiping God wherever you are. We've already had uh, some really incredible Christmas worship and uh, just a great time of worship and an opportunity to be able to give. And I hope that this season that you give generously in every area of your life, and that you are able to receive the rich blessing of God's love in your life and in your family. 
It has been an amazing year here with Potomac Valley, and we are blown away by the opportunity to be able to connect with you. Some of you in your living room, some of you when you're traveling down the road, just listening to the service, some of you far and some of you wide and some of you close by, some of you who haven't been able to make it out to in-person service, but you're a part of the Potomac Valley Church or now the Potomac Valley broader community. We are so grateful that we've been able to gather, to serve, and to see Jesus multiplied with you in 2021. As we go into 2022, we anticipate that the Holy Spirit is going to call us further up and further in as we learn to truly follow the movement of the Holy Spirit, follow the fire of the Holy Spirit. But this Sunday, we are going to get to look at the beginning of our story. You know, in truth, our story begins in Genesis. It begins with creation. But the creative force of God, who created the entire world and everything in it, made a choice to enter humanity and to come in the form of Jesus, our own Emmanuel, God with us. And today we're going to explore the story of Jesus' birth and the lessons that his birth teaches us and the message that's been transmitted to us over 2,000 years. Before we do anything, let's pray for insight. God and Father, open our minds. Open the eyes of our hearts. Help us to have understanding and clarity and conviction that only you can give. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide our conversation, guide our thoughts. Touch the hearts of our friends, our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers and our fathers all over the world that are able to join us in worship today. And God, I pray that your Spirit would speak to their heart as your spirit, we do pray, will guide this conversation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's get into the story. You may have read the story before, or maybe you're reading it for the very first time. But I pray that the eyes of your heart and the eyes of my heart are open to hear the story anew and afresh. Because I think the Holy Spirit is really trying to teach us some incredibly important messages from this story. Turn on over to Luke chapter 2. We'll start in verse 1. Now, please remember that the, the gospel of Luke was written by Dr. Luke, and he puts forward an orderly account um, to Theophilus. So you'll notice some distinctive things here in Luke is he's speaking to a Roman audience. Uh, so he doesn't identify as much with genealogies or with things that uh, a Jewish audience would identify with, but instead with dates and people that the broader Roman world would identify with. And so he begins chapter 2, verse 1, with this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census, census which took place when Quintus was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. Now this is really important because we have extra biblical evidence to support uh, this census and that this census would have been taken in what is now considered AD 8 um, and that these censuses were taken every 14 years. And, um, and Judea, which would have uh, fallen under the jurisdiction at that point of Syria, would have a census that would be identical to the census that would have been taken uh, of Egypt which was also under Roman control at this point in, in history. And so we have extra biblical evidence that, that shows this process of taking a census and that every man or every head of household would be required to go back to their place of tribal ancestry. Uh, this would mean that Joseph would go down from, from Nazareth. And we'll just pick up and read here. It says, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So, Every 14 years, these censuses are taken. So we know that happened. Uh, Joseph uh, was a part of the, the uh, lineage of David and therefore needed to go to Bethlehem. Uh, this was a treacherous 80 
mile journey that they had to go on, uh, taking them all the way from the, the town of Nazareth, uh, all the way in, in Galilee to Judea and then to Bethlehem with a, with a pregnant wife. Um, it is amazing uh, just the, the journey that they would have had to take uh, as a young family here going to Bethlehem. But then when they get to Bethlehem, you would expect, um, as Jewish people, uh, that they would receive a warm hospitality. They were going to the place of his ancestry. Um, but obviously there were lots of people that had come, lots of people that were there. And you think about the choices that those people made. Uh, they see a, a young man with a young family, with a pregnant wife, and you'd think, man, they would say, we'll give you a room. You can stay with this family member, stay with that family member. Um, but there was no, no hospitality waiting for them. You'd also think, you know, when they, they got there and they went to the inn, that someone who was in the inn, that maybe they, um, you know, didn't have a pregnant wife, that they would give up their room so that this young uh, pregnant family, uh, pregnant woman and, and young family would be able to have a room. But no one made space for Joseph or for Mary. Uh, instead, uh, they were able to um, uh, have Jesus in what would uh, effectively be a, an open courtyard. So if you look at the layout of inns and the way things were laid out in that time, there was an open courtyard and there was an area there where the animals would have been kept. And, um, and Jesus was placed in a manger and that is effectively a feeding trough for the animals. Um, because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, I remember when Tasha and I uh, were trying to figure out where our son, Makai, and our daughter, Journey, would be born. Um, and uh, in the case of our son, Makai, he was born in Atlanta. And uh, we did a thorough um, uh, kind of inspection of the, the facilities there in Decatur. It's still right there uh, in Decatur. And... Um, and we met with the doctors, we met with the nurses, we evaluated everything that was there. When Journey was born in, in Philadelphia, we did the exact same thing. We went through the classes. Um, you know, the, my children being born in a safe, sanitary environment was really important. Uh, my children being able to get the best medical care was very important. And, you know, Tasha, when, when Makai was coming, Tasha actually went through two days of labor and I had questions for every single medical intervention, whether it was uh, just giving a little bit of uh, medicine or the epidural or every doctor, every nurse that came in, I had lots of questions. And Tasha can tell you, um, I you know, was prolific in my advocacy for my wife to get the very best care. Now, the creator of the universe picked the time and he picked the place. He could have chose anything. If he chose, Jesus could have been born in the palace of Caesar in Rome. He could have been born surrounded by the best medical care of the time. If he chose, he could have been born in Jerusalem, in the, the, the palace of Herod. He could have been born in the governor's house in Syria. God could have chose any place, any time, but he intentionally chooses to enter our world and to be born in a courtyard and to be placed for his first place of rest in a feeding trough for animals and to have the young family that's caring for him travel 80 miles in dangerous terrain. We serve a God who is very, very, very clear in his message. His entry into the world was a clear message that his desire was that all people, from the lowest of men to the highest of kings, would have access into his kingdom. And his birth tells us this. The response of humanity to him also teaches us an important message that a lot of times we get consumed in our own interests and we don't make room for God in our lives. As we get ready to go into the Christmas season, let me ask you a question. 
have you welcomed Jesus into your life? Is there room for him? Or does he find himself in the courtyard of your life? Does he find yourself in the, the, the undesirable places in your life? Or is he central to everything in the living room of your life, in the intimacy of the bedroom of your life, in your, your, your place of highest regard or in the place of least regard? In our society today, as it was 2,000 years ago, we treat Jesus the same way. We often don't make room. But Jesus does not treat us that way. In fact, he comes into the world, grows up to be a, a man of renown and recognition and faith and character and courage. And he tells his disciples that in his father's house, there are many rooms. There's always room for God. And God always makes room for us. But we have to make choices about making room for him however he might express himself to us. Let's continue reading the story because there's even more insight that we get after the birth of our Messiah, our Emmanuel. Verse 8. Now there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Good news of great joy that will be for all people. If you think that my statement about God's engagement going from the least to the greatest was just my own conjecture, Luke, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, underscores this point. God goes to shepherds. They are the lowest people in society at the time. They are living out in the open field. They're exposed to the elements. And you would think that this message would have come to the highest of kings. No, it comes to the lowest of people and the angels of the Lord. There's a divine intervention, a divine message. And the message is this. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior is born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them, and gone into, into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby that was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told, what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which, had just, which, which was just as they were told. I am amazed at the willingness of Mary. Last week we talked about the Magnificent. We talked about her faith and her song and her willingness to trust God, this young teenage girl, to trust God to do what had never been done before and would never be done again, for a virgin to have a child. I'm amazed at the courage of Joseph to not say, you know what, Mary, why don't you stay home? But rather, I completely claim you as my wife, even though we've not had any physical relations, and I'm willing to trust God that we're going to go on an 80-mile journey to the home of my ancestors, and I'm going to trust God to provide a way. I really am inspired by Joseph's courage. But I'm also taken aback by the selfishness of the people of Bethlehem and by the humility of God. You know, when you have all the power of the universe at your disposal, it would be easy to use your power for your own glory or use your power for your own interest. 
And we live in a world where we often see people abuse their power. But our God and our Jesus shows us the way of humility, the way of righteousness, the way of going from the bottom and serving all people. Our message has been and always will be that we need to follow Jesus, that we need to follow the fire. And as we embrace hospitality for the holidays, I pray in this conversation that we're having that we can make a choice to make room for all people. Let it not be said about us that when God comes knocking at our door, that we say there's no room. Now, how could that play out for us here? As a church, we've talked a lot about the importance of Matthew 22, loving God with everything and loving your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 25, loving the least of these and seeing God in the face of every person, specifically Jesus in the face of every person. And Matthew 28, multiplying that message and spreading that message of love and transformation to people all over the world. And so I think it's fitting for us as we look at Luke 2 to take a glance at Matthew 25 and verse 40. Take a look over here with me. Because Matthew helps us to see how we can make room. Matthew 25 and verse 40, it says, The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. What does that look like? Verse 37 gives us context. The righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? How do you make room? Share your food with the hungry. When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? How do you make room? Providing for those who are thirsty. When do we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? What we do for the immigrant, what we do for the foreigner, what we do for the stranger, what we do for those who cannot do for themselves, for those who are incarcerated, for those who are sick and shut in, we do for Christ. We've got to make room. I honor the reality that God shows us about humanity in the response of the people of Bethlehem. But I think it's a challenge to me in my walk with God. And a challenge I want to put to you this Christmas. Enjoy the toys and the gifts and enjoy the food and the time together. You should enjoy every minute of it. It is a blessing from God. You should enjoy it. But be sure that you make room in your schedule for prayer and devotion. That you make room in your schedule for engaging with people that look different from you, that maybe even worship different than you. That you make room for those who are needy and that we guide our children to serve and to give and not only to be given to. What we do with our lives demonstrates the faith that we have. The Hebrew writer gives us even more insight into this. And I want to invite you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. It teaches us this about our Jesus, the Jesus who started out as a baby but doesn't stay that way. So in Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us about our Jesus, and it says in verse 14, Therefore, since we have a high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we will find mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus understands what it's like to be in an unsafe, unsanitary environment. He understands what it's like to not be welcomed in. He understands what it's like to be rejected, to be misunderstood. He understands what it's like to feel so much grief that he's at a point of pain and a point of just, I just can't, I can't even live. That's what he says in Matthew chapter 26. He's like, I'm overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. If you're feeling suicidal, 
like you have no hope. Jesus knows what that feels like. If you feel disconnected from people and like no one's there for you, Jesus knows what it feels like. If you feel abandoned and broken down, Jesus knows what it feels like. If you feel like you have all the power in the world, know that there's one who actually has all the power in the world. And he chooses to use his power and his position of privilege to lift others up. He knows what it feels like to feel powerless and to be powerful. He knows what it feels like to be hungry as he was in the desert and to be well fed. He understands our condition, our human condition. And this holiday season, as we try to make sense of what it means to embrace the miracle of Christmas, the miracle of Jesus' birth and entry into the world, my prayer for you, as it is for me and for my family, is to make room. I'll be honest with you. I don't understand God's courage. I would not have put my kid in that situation. But God knows, and he knew that we needed to see who we really are. We needed to see how far he was willing to go. It wasn't just on the cross that God makes this point, and he absolutely does make it on the cross. But God's made this point through all of humanity and through Jesus' entire life. From his birth, his beginning, to his death, the midway point, to his resurrection that offers us the hope of resurrection. The miracle of God, the miracle of Jesus, the miracle of this holiday season is that God always makes room. And when he does, he doesn't just make room for some people, but he makes room for all people. There's a place for you here in God's kingdom. There's a place for you here among God's people. And I pray that you know there's a place for you here with us in the Potomac Valley Church. I pray that you can reach out to us. You can send us a direct message. You can email us. You can connect with us through our mobile app or through our website. And if you feel lonely and disconnected, if you feel like there's no room for you, I want you to know that there is room for you in God's house. We're committed to make room. And I want to challenge all of us to make room. Because God is leading us in triumphant procession to something more transformative than we could have even asked or imagined. Let's go to God in a word of prayer as we pray for the communion this last time before we celebrate Christmas. God, thank you for our community. Thank you for the love that you've given us. Thank you for the faith that we're able to enjoy because of your mercy and your kindness towards us. God and Father, I pray that you bless this bread that represents your son's broken body and this juice that represents your son's blood spilled on the cross. And I pray that as we embrace this sacrifice, that we can see that from beginning to end, your message has always been the same. It's been an invitation for all people. It's good news for all people. And we embrace this good news even as we commune together right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Merry Christmas. May God bless you. And I pray that you will be a miracle and a blessing to someone else as you embrace God's heart to always make room for all people.
true